He's currently one of the uh, trauma surgeons at Grant Medical Center. Please welcome Dr. Josh Hill. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is, uh, of course, an honor to be just uh, here and emceeing, but to give a lecture also is pretty cool, too. So uh, I don't know who you guys made angry to have to suffer through a full day and then a lecture with me, but I would, I would make peace with them quickly. Um, I am allotted 45 minutes. Probably won't go that long, but, uh, but we'll see here. They said, uh, Hill, why don't you talk about perspectives in trauma care? I said, that sounds great. Uh, uh, what, what is that? And they said, well, whatever you want it to be. And I said, okay, well, we could talk about inspiring stories or new research of you know, useful things. Eh, okay, they said, or you can, uh, in one lecture, try to collectively piss off the entire pre-hospital uh, uh, force of Central Ohio by telling them they're doing things wrong. I said, uh, yeah, I'll do that. That's, that's good. So that's what you get to end on here. Um, so we're going to talk about some things that, that um, all kidding aside, some uh, common pre-hospital things that we have done historically that we are doing now that I believe deserve a little bit of challenge. And so when coming with the title, I thought, well, maybe we could do slaughtering the sacred cows. And I thought, oh, that's a bit heavy handed. Uh, so I thought, okay, well, why don't we call it, uh, oh, no, he didn't. But I thought that was a bit early 90s. And so I settled on, uh, wait, what? Uh, <laughs> This challenging common pre-hospital practices with some evidence. We're talking about three things today. Hypotensive resuscitation, backboards, and TXA. We're going to start easy. We're going to wade our way into the deep end here. So hypotensive resuscitation, I'm not here to challenge that at all, uh, actually. I think hypotensive resuscitation is a sort of a challenge to what we had done historically for many, many years. Now, I would imagine most everybody is sort of caught up with this, but it's always nice to kind of go over this again, I think, and a very brief review of, of what led us here. For the longest time, especially, you know, ATLS, everybody taught that when you picked up a traumatically injured patient, they get two large bore IVs and you give them two liters of crystalloid right off the gut. Everybody remember that? It's not been that long ago. I'm uh, older than uh, uh, I hope I look at some point, um, but even I remember, it was, it's been five years ago that we were teaching that in ATLS. So what could be wrong with that? Well, the problem is hemorrhage needs control. Uh, and the body knows that, the body's pretty smart. So if you get shot, stabbed, you get a, a, a penetrating injury to a blood vessel of some kind, the body's gonna try to make clot. It's gonna typically succeed in making clot to try to stop that bleeding. So if we, see a kind of a thready blood pressure and well, you know, what do we want to see? We want to see 120 over 80, right? Makes everybody feel better. I want to see that cuff go up and a nice three digit systolic pressure and I feel great now. Well, that might not be the best thing for the body because if you jack up that blood pressure against a clot that's holding on for dear life, you're very likely to pop that thing off and that is self-defeating. And of course, what are we giving them in the field? Uh, probably not yet, at least not nothing I'm aware of in central Ohio. We're not giving them blood just yet, we're giving them salt water. And blood does not equal salt water. I figured out how to do that on the PowerPoint. I'm very, every animation you see, I am so proud of because I'm not very good with this stuff. But. Um, and so, you know, you're giving them salt water to replace things like clotting proteins and, and hemoglobin and, and platelets, um, and that's obviously not, not the right thing. Now, blood product resuscitation is its own talk. We won't get into that. But So what's the evidence? Uh, 94, I think, a uh, pretty landmark study uh, done in Houston. Uh, one of the authors uh, you're going to listen to next, as it happens, uh, Dr. Uh, Pepe. So uh, if I bungle this, please, uh, doctor, forgive me. Um, Houston takes 598 consecutive trauma patients with penetrating torso injuries uh, who present with a pre-hospital systolic pressure less than 90. Now that starts, wh whose who's bottom doesn't pucker a little bit when you start seeing a systolic in the 80s, right? Um, 289, got no IV fluids, which, as it turns out, equals about 92 mLs of fluid, not none. And they had a 70% survival rate there. Uh, a little over 300 received standard resuscitation, which in that pre-hospital setting equaled not quite a liter. It's not a huge difference, but you know, uh, about, a, uh, about a bag of saline. And they only had a 62% survival there. So they're saying that for hypotensive patients with a penetrating torso injury, delay of aggressive fluid resuscitation until operative intervention improved the outcome. You basically just kind of get them to hang on until you can get them into an operating room and we actually fix it. And that challenged uh, the sensibilities of the day. And it still challenges, I think, our sensibilities. 
Um, does everybody know hy who's practicing hypotensive resuscitation? Anybody show hands? Keep it in mind. Yeah, it's it's you know it, it's been around for a while, but it, I still get some surprised faces sometimes. Now there are some uh, mild criticisms, uh, especially with that study. Uh, there was a lack of intention to treat, meaning if you died before you got to the hospital, whether you're getting conservative fluid management or regular fluid management, they just tossed your data out. But when you throw that back in and reanalyze the data, it still shows at least no decrease in mortality with the low volume resuscitation. Um, so you have at least an equivalent study. We've had some other studies not quite this good uh, since then that have really sort of uh, driven this home too. So if not systolic pressure, what, what are we going to resuscitate to? I mean, we got we to give them some fluid, don't we? Well, here comes the military. And a lot of our best literature comes out of the military because unfortunately that's where a lot of our trauma occurs. Um, now I will tell you in the 21st century mm, like the entire world's information is organized on the internet but I will be damned if I could find this specific paper I'm looking for and it's driving me nuts so I apologize but what the military did was said we're gonna sort of arbitrarily say all right if not blood pressure I want a palpable radial pulse and I want to be awake and talking to me and if they have those things and we don't resuscitate them are they gonna do okay and it turns out they do. Um, <clears throat> so if they have a radial pulse and they're awake and talking to you, then you don't need to resuscitate them anymore. If they lose those things, also keep in mind, whoop, come back to me. Oh, bother. I don't know if my new one got it. It's okay. Um, if they do not uh, have these things, small, small boluses of fluid. We don't need to open up two liters wide open on them for all the above stated reasons. So that's a simple thing. All right. Got your legs stretched? Oh, uh, that's right. First of all, and this is uh, a bit of a challenge to it, at least a, a, a warning, because we have encountered this a bit here at Grant every once in a while. Penetrating trauma only. Hypotensive resuscitation, aiming for just a radial pulse, just mentation alone, is only for penetrating traumas. In blunt trauma, hypotension must be avoided. Why? That dude. Brain has to be has to be well perfused. And any blunt trauma is a head injury until we can prove it otherwise. And so any blunt trauma, you really do need to aim for a good three-digit systolic pressure. Make sense? All right, everybody feeling good? Feeling warmed up? Ready to get a little deeper here? Backboards. Who's using backboards? Show of hands. Come on. I can see you all. Don't lie to me. Who's using backboards out there? Everyone's using back. I know. I see him come in. So you got to read the slide like uh, Edwin Starr. You know, backboards. Ugh. Yeah. Well, uh, they could. Okay, it's late. I'm gonna I'm gonna chalk that up because I know it wasn't my uh, flawless performance that, that got the groans there. Backwards. I mean, come on. Backwards. What do those hurt? Well, they do hurt. And we'll start with just just hurt, discomfort. They're no fun to be on. How many times do you get the patient that crabs endlessly about being on a backboard? We get them too in the trauma bay. Oh, I just want to get off this damn backboard. Um, they took a bunch of uh, pain-free, healthy volunteers. These weren't even injured patients. Stuck them on a backboard for an hour. That was it. And an hour is kind of a long time, I understand, but you know, an hour is not that long relative to things. Um, 24 hours later, they're still having back pain, lower back pain, and cervical pain. That that's not. That's not a small thing. And what we find actually that other studies have shown us is that when we put them on backwards and they come in with this back and this neck pain, we scan them more. They get more radio, uh, radiographs than they probably otherwise would because now I can't tell if that back pain's because they've been laying on a backboard or if they actually have uh, some sort of injury. Pressure ulcerations. Well, that doesn't happen. That's old people that lay in bed all day. No. Uh, somebody actually took infrared spectroscopy and, and, and looked at the tissues of the sacrum. And after 30 minutes on a backboard, and that is not that long, um, significant tissue hypoxia and the sacral tissue of healthy adults. How many healthy adults are you bringing to us? Smokers, elderly, people who may have decubiti already. So just 30 minutes on a backboard can, can really do some, some significant and irreversible damage at that point. Well, it's got, that's got to be it, right? Oh, no, no, no. Decreased pulmonary capacity. You put someone on a backboard and tighten the straps on them, and you know, you're not putting your foot in their chest and wrenching it down. You're just trying to secure them. But you take a healthy, non smoking male and put those straps on them, and they have a restrictive effect, that has a restrictive effect lowering the patient's force vital capacity. One of the main uh, 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 measures of pulmonary function goes down when you do this. And again, this is healthy, non smoking people. How many healthy, non smokers are you bringing in there? Not, not a ton, right? It would be the minority, I would argue. So you can have even pulmonary issues. Now you take somebody with broken ribs and a sternal fracture who's elderly COPD, and having them on a backboard for uh, any period of time can, can really affect that. And what else? Mortality. Now stop. But it's true. 
Increased mortality in penetrating patients. In fact, two times the risk of dying. Two times if you put someone with a penetrating injury on a backboard. Now why? Why do you think? Actually, give somebody, anybody, because I, I was curious about this. I hear time. That's exactly right. It takes on average, what did you say, two or three minutes to get someone on a backboard, get them strapped in? That's not that long unless somebody's bleeding to death. I defy you to sit there when you know someone's bleeding and just watch them for three minutes. So even that amount of time while you're doing something and time is flying uh, can actually have a significant effect because that's minutes that, you're not, that they're not coming to us where we can fix their bleeding. But I'm sure you're employing hypotensive resuscitation after this, so it will be fine. So do they help? Well, 2013 position paper from the Association of EMS Physicians and the American College of Surgeons, the Committee on Trauma, says, okay, who should we use backboard? Who can you consider backboard use on? Blunt trauma with an altered level of consciousness, spinal pain, neurologic complaints, anatomic deformity of the spine, high energy mechanism with either intoxications, they can't communicate, distracting injuries. These are you might want to put on a backboard. See, uh, may include those with. But do they help? We don't know. There's no studies. There's very, very few. I looked for an hour or two on, I could not find a study that talks about the benefits of full spine immobilization. There was one that compared uh, some outcomes from uh, an American city, down I can't remember which now, uh, to a Malaysian city who routinely does not put their patients on backboards and outcomes were equivalent. So if you want to compare uh, Malaysia to America and their backboarding system or lack thereof, they do just fine without them. But outside of that, there are no good studies that say, yeah, if you don't put them on a backboard, you're going to do them harm. That study doesn't exist. So do they help? Well, you, uh, in 2018, uh, American College of Emergency Physicians, National Association of MES Physicians, uh, Committee of uh, Trauma from uh, American College comes together, says, okay, we'll do this again. Now they talk about spinal motion restriction. And so the indications for SMR following a blunt trauma Remember Blunt, they actually they got that one figured out. Look at a lot of these things. Well, I put a little slide together here. Uh, in 2013, anyone with altered level of consciousness, same. Spinal pain or tenderness, same. Neurologic complaint, same. Anatomic deformity, same. High energy mechanism with distracting injury, same. So, oop. Well, now I know that was on there before. Well, that's okay. Um, not a lot of the indications changed. It's how we talk about spine immobilization. What do we do? What do we do about this? Consider all your options. A long backboard is just one of them. Scoop stretchers are great. The ones especially that can break apart in the middle on a bed, you just slide them out. Vacuum mattresses are nice. Just a plain old ambulance cot is fine. Now, use them only as long as you need to. I know we're not going to go and put all the backboards on a pile and burn them. That's silly. You, we need them. They're a useful tool. You need them to get people in and around, in and out of trucks, in and off of the cots. That's, that's fine. Um, you, you have people, I understand, that are going to flail around if you don't put them on a backboard and strap them down. That, that's okay. But remember, spinal motion restriction is an idea. It's not an object. So you can put someone on an ambulance cot, you can put someone on a vacuum mattress or break the scoop stretcher once you get them in there and just make sure that we're log rolling, make sure they're not flailing about the bed. It's an idea, it's a concept, it's not necessarily an object. All right, TXA. Who's using TXA? Really? If you've got it on the truck, given in our, in, our, in our first three hours and all that, yeah. Okay, this one's gonna hurt. <clears throat> this one hurts me. A brief history of TXA. Tranexamic acid, tranexamic acid is a lysine analog, competitively binds to plasminogen, which then turns into plasma that helps chew up clot. It's, uh, uh, plasminogen, plasma stops that fibrinolysis. In trauma, some clot is good, a lot of clot is bad, and no clot at all is, is also very bad. I'll talk more about that in a second. So TXA is, uh, uh, fibrinolysis basically helps keep the clotting process in balance, checks and balances, Political joke, political joke. Uh, used in uh, cardiac surgery and some other specialties before it really came to the trauma uh, world and people had good success with it. So along comes Crash 2. We've all heard of Crash 2. All hail Crash 2, right? It was, it was the, the, the gospel of TXA that came out. 2010, that's a nine-year-old study, which means that's probably 11-year-old data at least, maybe 12. More than 20,000 patients randomized with or at risk 
for significant bleeding, okay? All-cause mortality in folks who got TXA was 16%. Or, sorry, that did not receive TXA was 16%. All-cause mortality in folks that got TXA, 14.5%. That's only 1.5%. That doesn't seem like a lot, but when you extrapolate that over 20-plus thousand people, that's, that's a statistically significant effect. Well, what about just bleeding? Okay. Risk of death due to bleeding, 5.7% in the non-TXA group, 4.9% in the TXA group. Again, that's only 0.8%. That's not even a full percentage. You extrapolate that over 20,000 people. That's a statistically significant effect. And does it hurt people? No. Vascular occlusive events, DVTs, PEs, MI, stroke. If this thing is to stop clot from breaking down, then we want to make sure that we're not having too much clot, right? And it, the crash two seemed to tell us that, look, there's only 2% in the non-TXA group, not quite 2% in the TXA. That was not significantly different. And so that tells us that, hey, this thing saves lives, it saves all lives, it saves lives that are bleeding to death, and we don't have that many complications. So what did we do? We put TXA to everybody. And I, I, we went and espoused the, the, preached the gospel of TXA. And I know because I was in some of your houses preaching the gospel of TXA. And the gospel is not told yet. Um, next comes the matters trial, the next big one. This is the military again. Um, Military found about 896 uh, trauma victims, 239 of whom were given TXA. What they found was improved survival. Mortality now, a little, little bigger difference. You're talking about less people, but 17.4% in the non-TX, I'm sorry, in the TXA group versus 20, almost 24% in the non-TXA group. And they found no increased risk of VTE. So we have another good study in a, in a good trauma population that says that TXA is, is going to help us. This is, this is better than sliced bread. Any Lee Corso fans, right? Not so fast, my friend. A couple comments on the big studies. Crash 2, we start noticing that, well, over half of the patients didn't get any blood products. So what does that mean? Does that matter? Well, if you're talking about a patient population that it has or is at risk for significant bleeding, and they didn't get blood products, how significant was the bleeding, or how significant was that risk? And that, that's a reasonable question. Matters, uh, the matters trial, as with a lot of the military uh, trials, especially in this day and age, apples to apples is tough. Um, in the suburbs of Ohio, the chances of stepping on an IED are very slim. In Afghanistan and Syria, they are very high. And so we see a very different kind of injury in the military theater than we do in suburban and urban trauma. And so there's always the, the question, and rightfully so, you know, are we matching the same patients? Do, does the physiology match what we're studying and what we're trying to apply it to? So that's a reasonable question. But there's more. Father, I apologize. I, I literally, I read this yesterday. I thought I uploaded it. It's okay. It's my own fault. All of these studies, uh, 300 patients in the first, 160 in the second. Uh, There's a military one with about uh, 3,000. All called into question the utility of tech, TXA and trauma patients. They saw either no uh, benefit to mortality. They saw some increase in mortality in the folks who were given TXA. They saw not a uh, net equivocal amount of venous thromboembolic disease. They saw more in some of these cases. So now you have at least three or four studies uh, saying uh, that this may not be real helpful. There is no decrease, and in fact, there may be some increase in mortality and an increase in complications. Why? Well, the question is, what are we using the TXA for? Now, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but this is very important because I think this is the next step in the investigation of TXA. Remember we talked about fibrinolysis, breaking down some of the clot. Some clot is good, no clot is bad, a lot of clot is bad. Lysis of clots is part of the coagulation cascade. It's normal. It's what it's supposed to do. Now, there are three types of fibrinolysis. There's physiologic, normal, we're breaking down, you know, a little bit of the clot. There's hyperfibrinolysis, where we're breaking down all the clot. And there's fibrinolytic shutdown, which means we're not breaking down any of the clot. This was discovered by Tag. More on that in about four seconds here. Uh, the Moors and all the folks out of Denver who were really into this uh, saw there was increased mortality with the hyperfibrinolysis and the shutdown. So people who were breaking down all of their clot and people who were not breaking down any of their clot had an elevation in their mortality. Physiologic group had about 3% mortality. That's probably par for the course. Hyperfibrinolysis, 44%. And shutdown, 17%. Those are big time numbers. So 
maybe if only there was a drug that we could use uh, on hyperfibrinolysis. Oh, here, let me show you this real quick. How is it measured? So uh, we usually just with TEG, thromboelastography. Now, this is another hitch in the giddy up because if we're trying to target patients with hyperfibrinolysis, we've got to be able to diagnose hyperfibrinolysis. And that's something, not something we can do on the truck. It's not something a lot of hospitals do in their hospital. Uh, at Grant, we only got a TEG machine uh, a couple of few years ago, and it's really only been functional for about a year. Um, this is uh, like rocking around the Christmas tree. It's the new old-fashioned way. TEG's been around for decades and decades and decades. Um, and it sort of, sort of fell out of favor for a little bit because I don't think we knew what to do with it. And it's now back in a pretty big way. The, uh, the core of it is there's a little pin in a cup of blood, which is gross. And it just twists and twists and twists and twists. And as the clot starts to form in that cup of blood, it retards the, uh, the twisting motion of the needle. And we can watch that happen. So if you look at the, um, yep, there we go. If you look at the tag, this is what we look at then. There are numbers attached to this as well. Uh, but we see this is the time it takes to begin making a clot. This is how strong the clot becomes. And then this is how we, the body starts naturally breaking down some of the clot, which it is supposed to do. The thing we measure uh, for clot lysis, for how well we break down the clot, is the LY30, ly lysis 30. Uh, the percent of clot that is lysed at 30 minutes, real cute. Normal should be a, a between 0.08 and 3% of the clot should be broken down. Anything less than that, you have fibrinolytic shutdown, meaning you're not breaking down enough of that clot. If you have more than 3% on your LY30, you are in hyperfibrinolysis. You're breaking down more than you should. Now remember, the mortality rates then, when folks that were given uh, with this fibrinolysis, uh, show that physiologic 3%, Hyperfibrinolysis, 44%, and shut down 17%. So target hyperfibrinolysis, right? That must be it. All the studies that we're seeing where TXA was not working, we probably weren't catching the folks in fibrinolysis, right? Well, let's study it. Does it work? I don't have good news for you. Tranexamic acid was associated with increased six-hour survival, okay, but does not improve long-term outcomes in trauma patients with hemorrhage who develop fibrinolysis. They found the people, measured their tag, found the folks with fibrinolysis, saw that they got uh, TXA, and nothing helped. It didn't help them. That's a bummer. But there's no harm done, right? I mean, we decided there's no VTE risk. That's probably okay. Oh, dear. Patients who received TXA were more likely to develop systemic inflammatory response syndrome. They were more likely to have acute kidney injury. They were more likely to have sepsis. They were more likely to have multi-organ system failure compared with the no TXA group. Oh, that's, that's disappointing. Stop. Oh, no. TXA associated with more than a threefold increase in the odds of VTE, and tranexamic acid was not significantly associated with survival. Oh, yeah, one more. Patients who received TXA were at increased risk of fibrinolytic shutdown compared with patients who did not receive TXA. So to summarize, happily, TXA may improve mortality, may not help with mortality, <laughs> may increase mortality, actually, may not increase vascular occlusive disease, but may increase VTE rate. Works best for hyperfibrinolysis, but doesn't seem to work for hyperfibrinolysis. And it actually may trigger fibrinolytic shutdown, which puts you in the wrong direction, and then, then we have more mortality that way. This is called a shruggy, by the way. I was Googling the shrugging emoji. It has a name. It's called the shruggy. So there you go. You learned something. And it sure isn't what to do about TXA. So what do we do? Right now, nothing. Take a deep breath. Um, this, is a very, this is a very interesting time in looking at a very interesting drug. Uh, I spoke with Dr. Pandy, who's my medical director. If anybody's ever met Dr. Pandya, you will know this is the most Pandya thing he could possibly say. When I talked to him, I said, well, what, what should our message be to the folks? He said, our message is that we have no message. <laughs> so that, that sounds about right. Right now, we don't do anything. Exercise patience. More research is needed. We need some more specific investigations, and those things are ongoing. I think there's more to be done with thromboelastography and the idea of defining hyperfibrinolysis. Um, some of the studies that show no uh, mortality benefit also said we just didn't reach it because of statistical significance, meaning if we had more patients, then we might actually show the same mortality benefit. But until then, patients. I have a two-year-old daughter, and they don't call it the blissful twos, you know. 
and so we have a lot of meltdowns in my house every day. And uh, at some point, I told I said, Hazel, you gotta, you gotta just show Daddy some patience, please. And she latched on to this, and so now it's really adorable, even in the midst of a crisis, where I'll say, Hazel, would you please show, da show Daddy some patience? And she goes, patience. patience. And she says it weird, too. She doesn't say it normal. Somehow she turns into uh, ludicrous when she goes, patience. But it's really cute. She's even started to do it with this, too. She'll go, patience. I think it's because she sees me do that probably 20 times a day because I didn't twist the, twist the stem off of her apple correctly the other day. That was a meltdown. <laughs> so show Persians. We'll get there. So in summary, hypotensive resuscitation only in penetrating injuries. Any blunt component, make sure you're keeping triple digit systolic pressures. That's fine. Aim for, otherwise, aim for a radial pulse and mentation and use small volumes to resuscitate if you need to. Backboards likely do more harm than good. This is a tough one, because I know we use them a lot. Um, use them very sparingly, as sparingly as we can, and uh, remove them as soon as possible. If we can help at having them off of a backboard before we get to the trauma bay, where we spend another probably five to 10 minutes with them laying on a backboard doing our exam and everything, getting them off as soon as possible is very important. And maintain spinal immobilization. That, that's, that's okay. That's still a thing, and it's a very important thing, but it doesn't have to be on a long, hard backboard. TXA? I don't know what the hell to tell you. Right? My apologies for some softcore profanity here at the back nine of the conference. Uh, I figured this was a crowd that could, that could do okay with that. But uh, I, I, I don't know what to do. Because right now, uh, I think uh, science at large doesn't quite know what to tell you about TXA. I think more information and more opinions will be coming. Continue to follow your local protocols. Do the things you're doing. That, that's okay. You're, you're not hurting people right now, I, I, I don't think. Um, so continue to do those things. Um, I don't think that we can ignore the Crash 2 study. That was 20,000 people. It's an amazing feat, really, of science. Even if you took out the half of people that didn't get blood, you're still talking about 10,000 people, which is some 9,000 people more than we have collectively in some of these other smaller studies that show no effect to TXA. So I think we're doing the right things right now. Keep doing the right things. I think there was a thank you slide. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. I will I'd be happy to take questions. Would or you comment be... on oh. cervical collars? Beg pardon? Cervical collars? Oh, yes. That one, I didn't really, I didn't wade into that uh, uh, miasma just yet. There is actually, uh, off the cuff, there is a fair amount of literature that tells us that cervical collars probably are not as helpful as we would like them to be also. Um, uh, there's a fascinating talk I saw a few years ago where they actually watched under fluoroscopy as you applied a cervical collar to someone and the spine was a grotesque sort of extension and torsion. It's very weird. Um, and in fact, long backboards may hurt cervical immobility too. Um, right now, I don't have enough literature to tell you one way or the other. I think much like spine, full spine immobilization, immobilization is the most important thing. Certainly anyone with an index of suspicion for cervical spine should not be able to do this. Now, whether that's with a cervical collar or folks with a big neck that you can't get one on, just tape over the forehead, some towels, that's all fine. Again, it's a concept, not a device. So, uh, but I think that cervical immobilization still is a very important, very safe thing to do. Well, you know, I think that uh, it is certainly having it conform a little bit more. The question was, uh, any advantages to the vacuum mattress? And to be frank with you, I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, but I would say that the things it does is takes off some of the pressure points. Because it will conform to the, to the person and their habitus a little better, you don't have the sacrum, occiput, middle of the shoulder blades um, kind of pressure points. And so for as long as they will be in transit, I think offloading some of that direct pressure and the resultant ischemia to those tissues is probably of benefit. Wait, nothing on TXA? I really thought that was going to stir the pot here. No? Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your time. <clears throat> you are... Any, any other questions right now that I can answer? Or, uh, 
Did we all make it to the donut bar? What is that? That's not a snack. Come on now. I said, a snack. I'm going to come down and have some nuts or fruit or something healthy. I walked down, and there's a damn donut bar. I said, well, and I'm not going to not eat donuts, for heaven's sake. So I don't know if they had the jar of Genuvia out there to top your donuts with or what. Yes, please. The comment is that the chiropractors in the emergency department will straighten out the spinal issues. So I, I, I wait for their 20,000 person study. <laughs> Anything else? No, no TXA questions? Come on, come on. It's a tough time. I think that people were very excited about the Crash 2 study, and rightfully so, because it was, a, it was a, overall a very well done, very well organized study. And I think that the results are not to be ignored. Um, I think that we're just going to continue challenging it, as we should with all the paradigms, and, and see if we're really helping people, and make sure that we're helping the right people. That's the hardest thing, and that's why I don't think that you all should change anything that you're doing right now. Um, because in finding the proper patient population to treat with this medicine is probably going to take technology that only exists in, in a hospital right now. And so I think that uh, we're, we're, we're well justified in continuing uh, doing the things that you're doing. Please, Dr. Lowe, I would welcome a question. So, permissive hypotension question. Sir. If you could be fairly certain that the brain was not involved, do you see a benefit in permissive hypotension with blunt trauma? That's a good question. You know, I, I, uh, Josh Hill speak in truth of the universe, probably you could. If you were very certain that the head was not involved, I think that not disrupting clot the clot doesn't care whether it was formed from a blunt uh, trauma or a penetrating trauma. Clot is clot, and all the same things um, apply. If it's a splenic injury that's trying to bleed to death, well, you don't want to blow the clot off that either. Um, the, 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 the real trick there, just as it is with the TXA, is patient selection. And are any of us really willing and able to say with 100% certainty that there is no head injury here? I'm going to go ahead and keep their pressure low. Um, you know, the off chance that there is some sort of head injury we don't see. So that's, that's tough. I think that, you know, like I said, if we, uh, truth of the universe, yeah, we, we could probably tell. You can tell the person that's awake and alert and saying, yeah, my belly hurts like hell because I got a splenic injury. But um, it's, very, it's very difficult to say that definitively in the field. I apologize. I know I had uh, was supposed to fill ten more minutes. I just thought we'd have just crazy questions, and I have a tendency to talk longer or quicker than I probably should. Um, oh, let's see here. <clears throat> I I can only BS for so long. Even my wife knows that, <clears throat> and I've done it very well for the five years that I've known her. That's how I'm married with with a kid, another one on the way now, because I, my BS powers are strong. But. Uh, <laughs> 